Good morning. Uh, my name is Darshan Mehta. I'm the Director of Education at the Osher Center for Integrated Medicine and uh, Medical Director at the Benson Henry Institute for Mind-Body Medicine. Uh, just uh, um, before I introduce our, our, our speaker for our talk, um, I wanted to just highlight a few things. Uh, one is um, at the end of this month, uh, there is a um, research uh, clinical and policy conference on Ayurveda and its role in cancer and palliative care, and the information is out on the podium. We also have uh, our next month, uh, which will be on Tuesday, July 2nd. Uh, Paolo Cassano from uh, Massachusetts General Hospital will be speaking on photobiomodulation treatment, and so basically uh, the role of infrared light uh, in the treatment of depression, uh, and uh, we'll have a case presentation on that. So please, please come. It's going to be exciting, sort of new technology type of presentation. Uh, and and then in the fall, uh, we have our network. Uh, o o the Osher Center uh, ha hosts its uh, by uh, every other year. We have a, a network forum, and uh, please register. Uh, it's free. Uh, and we have uh, Professor George Church, who is going to be our keynote uh, presenter there. Uh, as many of you know, he's an eminent uh, geneticist uh, based here at Harvard. So lots of very exciting events. Uh, and if you're not on any of our listservs thus far, make sure you sign in or ask uh, um, Atra or Jessica for information. Oops, I just, okay. So... Uh, with that, uh, it's really my uh, honor to present Dr. Helen Langevin, who's um, the director of the Osher Center for Integrated Medicine here at Harvard Medical School and Brigham Women's Hospital. She is professor in residence of medicine in, um, at Harvard Medical School. She's also visiting professor of neurological sciences at University of Vermont College of Medicine. And uh, she has multiple uh, uh, accolades uh, and multiple NIH uh, research awards, uh, but has really uh, been a pioneer, uh, as I've come to appreciate, particularly in the last several years, in the role of connective tissue and really its interface with many of the different integrative modalities that all of us uh, are seeking to better understand and incorporate, and has developed really sig amazing, groundbreaking, and provocative models to help us understand what they do, how they do it, and what might they be able to do? So, yeah. Thank you, Darshan. It's a pleasure to be to be back. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking about something a little bit different. Uh, some of some of you might know some of the work that we've done in my lab it, for a long, long time. We focused on chronic pain, musculoskeletal pain, low back pain, the role of connective tissue in in this. In, in the development of chronic pain, and also mechanisms of manual-based therapies, acupuncture, movement-based therapies. So why, so why cancer all of a sudden? Well, my, um, my lab got interested in, in cancer for the same reason a lot of labs are interested in cancer. It's because it is a, just this very enormous problem, very mysterious uh, problem, that we have spent a lot of countless uh, energy, time, money, uh, er I try to understand how, how does cancer happen and, and how do we treat it, how do we prevent it, how do, if, it's, if we treat it successfully, how do we keep it from recurring. And so it's, it's, it's really, uh, um, we, we, we have, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit the story of how we kind of uh, drifted in that direction and, and some of the recent um, studies that we've done on uh, how stretching, something very simple like stretching, can actually affect uh, the development of cancer. So what is cancer? Well, for a long, long time, people have been pondering about this question. And we think of cancer as being sort of cancer cells, right, that are dividing out of control. That's the hallmark of cancer. Cells in the body, if under normal conditions, have a job to do. They have specific instructions from their, their genetic material, from the signals that they get from around them, and they obey these commands, and they do what they're supposed to do. Cancer cells don't do that. They just march by their own drum, and they divide and divide, and then gradually they invade, right? They, they just rogue. 
And so naturally, for a long, long time, the vast majority of efforts to understand cancer have focused on the cancer cells, right? The culprits. And so along, one of the hallmarks of cancer is these cells are dividing out of control. They're, they're, they're not stopping uh, their cell division when it's appropriate. They just keep dividing and multiplying. And so pretty early on, a lot of focus was really fo of, of cancer research was even by the time people had a microscope and were able to actually look at these cells, and they saw that these looked different. They looked abnormal. They had abnormal nuclei. They just they didn't have the right kind of shape. And so really, people focused on, the, on these cancer cells. And then when, when we started getting more sophisticated about understanding cell division, people looked at chromosomes. These are the, 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 the little units of where DNA is packaged. And people started noticing that some cancers some cancer cells had abnormal chromosomes. One of the earliest one was called the Philadelphia chromosome. It was a chromosome that was associated with some types of leukemias. And so that gave clues that really maybe there's something wrong that, that that's maybe how cancer happened, is that cell division goes awry. And then we got even more sophisticated and we started understanding the DNA itself inside the chromosomes. And we were able to measure and, and, and precisely uh, see the mutations, like the little abnormal little uh, units of DNA that could lead to cancer, and some of the carcinogens that people started to understand, ionizing radiation uh, and, and uh, environmental toxins, smoking, things like that, that actually caused breaks in the DNA, mutations, and that that in animal models led to the development of cancer. So, this enormous focus inward on the cells, on the division machinery of the cell. But then there were some researchers in the minority that started to really zoom out. Instead of zooming in, 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 and really trying to understand the cancer cell, and really started to look at the cancer, but in a, uh, in a lower power, in its environment, inside the body, and started thinking about, well, the cancer needs to grow in something, right, on, on something, in the tissues. It's not just growing in a vacuum. And some of the earlier investigators uh, started looking at what we call the microenvironment, right, of the tumor. Well, when we say microenvironment, it's because these tumors, when they start, they, they're not enormous tumors. They start small. They start just a couple of cells. And these cells get a hold someplace, and they start growing. And one of the earlier observations that were um, here at Harvard, at uh, Dr. Judah Folkman's lab at the Children's Hospital, started thinking about that the cell, the cancer, needs nutrients to grow. It needs a blood supply. And so this whole concept that the cell, need, the cancer here in blue, needed blood vessels to feed it. So it needed to somehow hijack the blood, the body's blood supply in order to serve its purpose, which is to grow, right? And so this research was very promising in that people felt, well, not only that, but there was a discovery that the cell secretes substances that actually promotes the growth of new neovascularization, new, new blood vessels, as these are what we call angiogenic factors. And so the thought was, well, if you could somehow interrupt that and and uh, uh, re uh, suppress the growth of these new uh, blood vessels, perhaps the tumor would uh, stop growing. And so there was a great uh, sort of in uh, enthusiasm for developing angiogenesis inhibitors. These are, these are uh, drugs that uh, uh, show, slow, slow down the formation of, of new blood vessels. But just like a, a lot of times when there's early enthusiasm for something, but there, these drugs also had side effects. Some of these drugs actually cause a lot of bleeding side effects. And, and so, and some of these drugs are still being used, but there was not, the initial enthusiasm for their use was not uh, transformed, as they translated into sort of widespread um, use. Meanwhile, there was also an understanding of the immune environment inside the cancer, extremely important. So why? Well, the body does not just sit there and, and sort of uh, stand by. When a cell starts to transform, 
normally what happens is the body fights it. This is very similar to what happens during a viral infection. If you have a virus, your, the virus goes inside your cells, and then it sort of hijacks the DNA machinery of the cell to try to make, get it to make more viruses and replicate it. And so that causes the virus-infected cell to become abnormal. And ex it expresses uh, receptors on its surface, and then the, li the, the, the immune system of the body recognizes that and starts attacking those abnormal cells and, and destroying them. Well, similar things happen in cancer, specifically lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are cells that can have both innate immunity and also acquired immunity so that what they do is they recognize something that's wrong and they will go and, and uh, attack it. So the thought was, okay, how could we enhance that? How can we help the body to get rid of these wrong uh, cells? And so there was a, there's a whole sort of uh, area of very intense research uh, that is going on uh, to this day, very, very um, promising, what is immune therapy, right? Uh, so how do we give uh, drugs, again, that uh, either block uh, um, areas that impair the immune system or enhance areas where the immune system could use a little boost in attacking these cells? The problem is that this process of killing cancer cells causes damage because you don't, it's, it's like it, if, you, if you're going to kill some cells, there's, there's going to be some collateral damage to that, right? And that damage is inflammation. And so uh, there is a lot of inflammation inside, inside tumors. And so the idea is, well, and we know also that inflammation can, be, can promote the growth of the cancer. So there was also, in parallel to the immune eff eff uh, efforts to enhance the immune response, there was also efforts to decrease the uh, inflammatory response. And so you could see this kind of seesaw uh, goal, uh, very tricky to achieve. And a lot of the immune therapies, unfortunately, have very strong, severe inflammatory side effects. So this is tricky, right? But this is, this is ongoing, and, and we, you know, we, um, this, is, this is still very, very obviously promising research, but as you can see, it's not easy. So what about this green stuff here? Well, that is the connective tissue of what we call the stroma, the tumor-associated stroma. And what is that? That is essentially the bed onto which the tumor sits. And the connective tissue uh, was, has been described for a long time. Uh, you know, a century ago, a microscope pathologist would look in the microscope and see that there was the cancer cells uh, are essentially surround, surrounded by um, uh, structure of connective tissue. That's what allows the, connect, the cancer cells to have the tumor to have a shape. Otherwise, the cells would just be sort of floating around. So this tumor-associated stroma became interesting to some people because they, people noticed that when the that some of the characteristics of the stroma may had something to do with how invasive the cancer was. And specifically, when the stroma is very thick and stiff, that can encourage the, the, uh, the growth of the tumor. And so people got really interested in suppressing the stroma. So guess what? They made up some drugs to re reduce the amount of stroma. And, to, and these would call stroma suppressors or inhibitors. Well, those didn't work so well because these are very strong drugs. These are like metalloproteinase inhibitors, the things that wreak havoc with the rest of the body, right? Well, then the idea is, well, let's, let's deliver the stroma inhibitors only in the tumors, and there's a lot, a lot of efforts on that, but generally these efforts were disappointing. So what's in common with all of these efforts? Well, they're all drugs, right? They're all substances that you inject or take in the form of a pill or things that are, you know, uh, in, administered pharmacologically. And there's a reason for that, because our whole real approach to therapeutics is very much uh, determined by our approach to understanding physiology. And Really, our understanding of physiology is very much dominated by our whole approach to biochemistry, right? 
we really, since the beginning of the 20th century, when we discovered biochemistry and uh, sort of the metabolic pathways, for example, and uh, even now, these what we call complex systems, right, of metabolic pathways and genetic uh, pathways and all kinds of signaling pathways and metabolomics and, you know, genomics and lipidomics and everything omics. Well, these are still, this is still biochemistry. It's still molecules that are essentially floating around, right? And when you, the, the general sort of uh, uh, logical approach to biochemistry is a biochemical treatment or chemical treatment uh, directed at the sort of uh, the, the systems of molecules that are sort of governing all of these physiological processes. Well, recently, I would say in the last 20, 30 years, there has been another sh a shift towards really uh, understand not just the biochemistry, but also the physical environment where all this biochemistry is happening. And there's been a realization recently that over the most of the 20th century, we've sort of ignored the fact that mechanical forces interact with every single process of the body from every tiny little molecule inside the cell, even, even with DNA replication and everything, and, 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 and cell division and uh, the functioning of organs and the whole body. At every single level, there, there, there is an, uh, an inter interface, an interaction between the biochemistry and the biophysics. And a, a nice example of that I've illustrated here, where um, as microscopy techniques became uh, more and more sophisticated, we used to think that cells are basically like little bags, right, where there was these molecules floating around that was sort of going uh, along concentration gradients. Well, we now know that that's not true. The cell is actually filled with these sort of structural proteins that, where, that influence how molecules get together and come apart and come in contact with each other. It's not random. So, for example, here you have what we call illustrated uh, the cytoskeleton of the cell that we've discovered with more powerful microscopy techniques, where you have, for example, actin filaments or microtubules or, or intermediate filaments, where these, these, um, the molecules, which are, for example, illustrated in green here, are come, either come together or go or fall or come apart, depending on how the cytoskeleton is organized. And so you, we've had also techniques where you can apply a tiny, tiny little force on the outside of the cell using a little magnet, and you can pull on the cytoskeleton and see the molecules come apart and go together. And, and at the same time, uh, molecules docking in and out of their receptors. It's very, very uh, elegant uh, and, and amazing, actually, to be able to actually see that under the microscope. So this obviously is a young field, the field of mechanobiology, right? We, we have not, this is a new, relatively new, I mean, there, there's been research on this for a long time, but it's really been relatively recent that people have realized the extent of it and the importance of it. And, of course, now the idea of mechanotherapeutics. And this is a really nice poster I've, I've uh, illustrated uh, right here at the Wies Institute a couple of years ago. There was a whole symposium on mechanotherapeutics. And it's very interesting to see how this has galvanized a, a lot of researchers from a lot of different disciplines, including engineering, molecular biology, genetics, and um, you know, rehabilitation, anyway, to, to come together and to really start looking at the effect of physical-based treatments that are not drugs, right? Okay, so going back to cancer, there is now the very uh, strong realization throughout uh, the uh, research community that factors such as stiffness, architecture, tissue forces have effects on all four of these components that I have explained here. We, nobody denies this. The question is, what, what do you do about it, you know? And that's the trickiest thing, because it's, it's tricky measuring these forces. Not only that, but then how do you apply a force? And, and how do you control it? And these are things that we're not, you know, uh, back in, you know, in the 19th century, where we were measuring forces and pressures and 
uh, for example, um, during breathing, respiration, cardiovascular events, and things like that. It's quite crude, right? Measurements of, of, of force, pressure, volume. And we still haven't really developed these measurements uh, as much as we have developed our measurements of, of, of biochemistry, for example. So we have some catching up to do. So as I said before, cancer, we know that connective tissue stroma is important. We also know that in some cases, so here, for example, I've illustrated a, a picture of a tumor where you see these lobules here, these sort of uh, sh um, collections of cells are surrounded by this pink stuff. This is a hematoxin and, and eosin stain, very, very standard pathology where you can see these sort of uh, roundish sort of lobules of stroma of connective tissue that surround the cancer cells. And sometimes we see something like this. This is, this is a, a cancer where these are the cancer cells here, and all this pink stuff is the, is the connective tissue. And you can see it's very thick. And this is called what we call a desmoplastic response. This is where pathologists have known for a long time, when you see this under the microscope, this is not a good prognosis. It, it's, it's a bad sign. And people can even feel, if you palpate a tumor and it feels very hard to the touch, that's usually also not a good prognosis. So the, the role of connective tissue has always been sort of known in the background, but now people are really starting to pay attention. There's the concept that uh, some time ago, uh, the people proposed that cancer had a lot, something to do with wound healing. Why is that? Well, normally in the body, when you have a wound, any type of wound, you know that at the beginning, you have what we call acute inflammation. So it's red, so we, we have the cardinal signs of inflammation, right? Rubor, calor, dolor, uh, it, it hurts, it's painful, it's red, it's swollen. And then the body gets to work, right? Acute inflammation is the only way you're going to heal a wound, right? If you didn't have acute inflammation, your wounds would just stay gaping open, and you would get it probably infected, you might die. So uh, inflammation then normally has to do its job, repair the wound, close it, and then stop, right? And that's called resolution. So within a certain number of days, if it's an uncomplicated little cut, uh, within you know, 48, 72 hours, you see the, red, the redness starts to subside, the pain starts to decrease, and then gradually you see a little you know, scab, and then your, your cut is history. You'll never think about it again. But if this, for some reason, doesn't happen, then you have what's called failed resolution. And it can turn into chronic inflammation. Some infl infections, for example, are like that, tuberculosis. They, it, it doesn't heal. It doesn't resolve. It turns into what we call a granuloma. There's, there's uh, some factors, uh, interactions between the host and the, and, the, and, the, and the infectious agent that fail to actually clear the bacteria. And therefore, the body tries to sort of contain the inflammation. And you get some amount of chronic inflammation in the tissues. And then that, lead, that can lead to what we call fibrosis, which is essentially an exaggerated scar. Like when you heal a, a, a normal wound, you get a tiny little amount of scar that essentially is the repair. Of, but if you keep repairing all the time, you just keep building up scar tissue. And that can cause uh, some pathology in organs, for example, in, in a lot of organs, pulmonary fibrosis, liver fibrosis, when there's chronic inflammation that keeps going all the time and that, that uh, doesn't resolve. So what about cancer? Well, cancer has been described some time ago as a wound that doesn't heal, that keeps going. Why is that? Well, because in addition to having all of these cells that keep multiplying, you also have chronic inflammation and chronic, uh, this kind of fibrotic response of the connective tissue, right, around the tumor that makes it look a lot like a chronic inflammatory situation. Pathologists have seen this, but they, would, they didn't quite know what to do about it for a long time. But there was this association between chronic inflammation and cancer has been known uh, for a while. What has recently been described, which is very, very important, is that there is a biomechanical relationship between the uh, chronic inflammatory and fibrotic response and the tumor in the form of stiffness. If the tissue underlying the tumor is stiffer, 
And you can, you can measure this in some models. You could, this encourages the cancer cells to not only grow, but also spread, right? Conversely, the cancer secretes factors that increase the stiffness of the tissue. So you can see it's a two-way circle, right? The cancer makes the tissue stiffer. The stiff tissue helps the cancer grow. So there's this kind of, this almost this, this positive feedback, vicious feedback, that, uh, that was noticed uh, by some investigators that are doing some very, uh, very important work uh, in this area in trying to really nail down what is it about the stiffness of the tissue and it's, we found that it's actually not just the stiffness, it's also the architecture. Uh, it's how the uh, collagen bundles are organized. There's some very nice work that was done at the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Patricia Keeley, uh, who unfortunately died last year. But uh, her, her, um, her work, very elegant, showed that uh, when you look at in biopsies of breast cancer in women who have had uh, metastatic disease compared with those that didn't, and you can see that the collagen bundles around the tumor are oriented almost like what they describe as like little highways where uh, of stiff collagen bundles that come at 90 degree angles perpendicular to the tumor. Whereas when the collagen is, and those are, those are associated with more invasion, when the collagen fibers are more wavy and sort of uh, randomly organized, that's not so, uh, the prognosis is better. So, this, it's, so the organization, the architecture of the tissue is important as well as its uh, mechanical properties. So in my lab, we've been interested in chronic inflammation, fibrosis, connective tissue stiffness, and inflammation resolution for quite a while now. And a couple of years ago, I gave uh, grand rounds and I talked about the work that we've done on uh, inflammation and resolution. And uh, some of you may have already seen our little rat model that we've used, we use for many different experiments in our lab. We use it in mice, we use it in rat, and this is, this is where we uh, induce uh, the animal to stretch. And the way we do this is that we've developed, developed this model back where, when I was at the University of Vermont, where if you hold very gently the animal by the tail and you lift its, back, its hind feet, its instinct is, if you allow it to grab onto something, so we let, we let the animal grab the edge of the, a bar of the cage or the edge of a table. And then what they do is they stretch. So they, this, they do this spontaneously. So they extend their, front, their back feet back, and then they pull with their front feet, and their entire body essentially stretches. They can hold this position for several minutes once they're trained. We don't make them do this you know, in, initially uh, 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 nonstop. But, we start with a few seconds and then a few minutes. And they can actually hold this position for up to 10 minutes, if you can believe it. And it's, it's really quite remarkable how they can, they can stretch their body and they really relax into this. They don't struggle. They, they just kind of hold, hold the pose. It's very similar to yoga. And it's very interesting how um, when one of the things that we were interested at, at first is inflammation. And we induced a tiny, tiny little amount of inflammation on top of the thoracolumbar fascia, which is in the back. And you can, uh, when you do this, when you stretch, you can, if you hold your arms up, and you can see that that really stretches the connective tissue of the back. You really have to hold the arms up. And that's what the rat is, is doing, essentially, is stretching the thoracolumbar fascia. And what we found with this model is that when you induce a tiny little amount of inflammation in the back, the inflammation resolves faster when the animal stretches for 10 minutes once a day. So we showed that, we published it, and we became very interested in the mechanism by which this happens. Well, there is a lab here at the Brigham, Dr. Charlie Surhan, who's been doing some very groundbreaking research for several decades now and, and discovered that there, there are molecules in the body that, are, that we fabricate derived from dietary omega-3 fatty acids in our diet. Like when, uh, we, when you have like fish oil, for example, these are the fatty acids that you need to ingest. But then once you have them, you can make these uh, molecules called pro-resolving mediators. And these are called resolvins, protectins, maresins. These are different types. So the ones that are mostly studied are called resolvins. And what these molecules do is they orchestrate the end of inflammation. And they are released at the very beginning, in the very first hours 
of an inflammatory response, it's already programming the ant. And this is very smart because you, you need a balance between inflammatory signals and resolution signals. Clearly, if you have a bacterial infection that's going out of control, you don't want to resolve that inflammation. You need that inflammation, right, if your wound is infected. If, on the other hand, everything's okay, bacteria has been cleared out of the body, it's cool, well, you want to resolve it. And so the balance between these mediators and the, and the resolving molecules, the inflammatory mediators and the resolving mediators is critical in deciding which way this is going to go, okay? And what we found is that stretching for 10 minutes once a day pushes the, uh, the, 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 the response in the direction of resolution. Okay, so what about cancer? Well, we decided, okay, if it works for inflammation, and let's try injecting a tiny little amount of tumor cells instead of uh, causing a tiny little amount of inflammation. In the back, we injected a, a very, very small amount of uh, tumor cells. These were uh, a, a breast cancer model, a P53, P10, double negative uh, mutant uh, that we inject in. You can, you can grow these cells in culture, and then we injected it into the third mammary fat pack. It's not exactly in the back, but it's close enough that when, you, when the mouse stretches, uh, it stretches that, the, the, that area. And so the tumor, the area surrounding the tumor is directly stretched during the, and we, the, the stretching. And uh, we did this, uh, the mice, uh, after being injected, uh, is, uh, was um, stretched uh, for 10 minutes uh, once a day. And we followed these mice for four weeks. And so in the uh, open circles, you can see these are the non-stretched animals. And the stretched circles are the uh, stretched animals. And you can see that over the course of four weeks, the tumors are growing slower in the stretched animals than in the non-stretched animals. And this was highly significant. We repeated this experiment so many times, I can't tell you. <laughs> we wanted to be really, really certain. That, that this was real, and it, there is no question about it, uh, the, that the stretching uh, uh, causes the tumors to grow uh, slower. So the question then is, well, why? And uh, it was, we spent a good amount of time uh, in the last uh, couple of years to try to figure this out. We don't have the answer, but we have some hints as to what may, we may, go, may be going on. Actually, I say it in press, it just got uh, released uh, just uh, a couple of days ago in the scientific reports, so um, it's no longer in press. So um, the first thing we went to look at is the pro-resolving mediators, right? Because we thought, well, if inflammation, remember I was talking about the inflammatory microenvironment of the tissues, and we already knew that uh, res uh, the, the pro-resolution mechanism were activated by stretching, we thought, well, maybe the same thing happens in the cancer. So we measured the resolvance in the whole tumors. We, we after the euthanizing the animal, we chop the tumor, we, we do an extract of the whole tumor, and we looked at both RVD1 and RVD2, which are both pro-resolving mediators, and they were quite a lot elevated uh, in, in the stretched animals. And so that was interesting, because right around the same time that we found that, uh, Dr. Uh, Sirhan's group, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Deepak Panigrahi at the BI, uh, found, uh, published a paper uh, about the effect of resolvance, injecting the resolvance in models of cancer. And they found that when you inject the resolvance, you suppress the growth. Not only that, but it was very interesting how they did the, the experiments. I'm going to show you a little bit about these experiments, because they're very, very interesting. So they created a model of what they call tumor cell debris. And what, the, what does that mean? Well, if you have a standard chemotherapy, right, the chemotherapy kills the cells very aggressively. And what happens is that you have a whole bunch of dead cancer cells. And what dead cancer cells do is they have, a little, a, and also apoptotic, which is a, a sort of, they, the cells are, um, uh, in the process of dying. And then they have on their so surface receptors that signal to the body that this is a cell that's in trouble. And also, once the cell has died, there are little fragments of cells that remain, what they call debris. 
And these debris also have these um, little receptors on, on them. And so the body recognizes this and, and tries to you know, uh, deal with that. And so what they wondered is, does the effect of the cell debris influence the growth of the cancer? And so they did an experiment where they injected uh, uh, what, these are Lewis lung cancer cells, what they call a, 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 uh, a, a, a sublethal dose. These are such a tiny little amount of cancer cells that normally they wouldn't grow. But they also co-injected an increasing amount of debris, dead cells. So what they do is they, they take a cancer, uh, cancer cells, they kill them, they make sure there's no live cells going on in there, but only the, the debris, only the, the, the remnants. And you can see that without dead cells, the blue line, the cancer doesn't grow. The dead cells alone don't do anything. But when you have an increasing amount of debris, the, 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 the tiny little amount of living cells is able to uh, proliferate and make a, a tumor. So what that suggests is that the debris enhanced the growth of the live cancer cells. Okay? That was very important. Then what they did is they injected uh, these, the RVD1 and RVD2, and they compared that to the chemotherapy. So here you have two chemotherapy uh, agents, and you then, and they did not affect the growth of the tumor. Here, uh, and here this is, a, this is the same situation here, where you have the cisplatin generated dead cells plus a tiny little amount of the living cells. So this would be like the one up here, right? So this is tumor cells plus debris. Chemotherapy doesn't touch it. You add the resolvents, they don't grow. So what that suggested is that the resolvents are helping the body deal with the debris, right, to make sure that, that, that the cancer wouldn't grow. So how did they explain this? Well, they explained this this way. When you have chemotherapy or radiotherapy, as I said, the tumor now generates all of these little debris that happen. One of the important molecules is called phosphatidylserine, or PS, and that really stimulates the macrophages to, okay, to really sort of secrete a lot of cytokines, what they call a cytokine storm. These are, these are molecules that, that are very, very inflammatory and, and, and um, to try to destroy the tumor. What the resolvents do is they tell the macrophage to do something different. They promote what they call a phagocytosis phenotype, where the macrophage, instead of going crazy and start releasing all these cytokines, it starts to engulf and get rid of the debris. So it reprograms the macrophages to a more what we call a, like a resolving direction, okay? So what we suggest in our experiment is that uh, because we see that the mouse, stretch mouse, naturally produces resolvents, uh, we showed that with inflammation. We also now see that in the tumor. We, we, this is what we think, is that the resolvents are actually acting the same way. It's that instead of injecting them, the mouse is actually making it themselves. But there was something that was bothering us, and that was that when we looked at the whole tumor, also we did what we call the cytokine profile, and we looked at other molecules, for example, interferon gamma and TNF-alpha. These are strong pro-inflammatory molecules. And we saw that they were elevated. This was not statistically significant, but it still concerned us because it still looked like the environment inside the tumor was mostly pro-inflammatory. So we decided, let's look at this some more. We did a transcriptome analysis where we looked at the gene expression in the tumor, and we saw the same thing. It looked like every, every profile that we saw that seemed to indicate that there was more in the direction of inflammation. Your, uh, more in the red direction indicates inflammation, more in the blue direction goes away, especially this interferon gamma. We were very, very interested in this interferon gamma. Why? Because interferon gamma, remember at the beginning I was talking about immune therapy? The body, interferon gamma is one of the most important cytokines that T cells use to kill cancer cells. In immune therapy, you try to increase that, right? You try to increase the body's ability to, to uh, what we call cytotoxic T cell ability. And what happens when a cytotoxic, when a T cell recognizes a cancer cell, first of all, it goes to the lymph node. And then there's a, a, something called IL-2, which is a, a cytokine that promotes it to clone, to multiply into a clone. 
And then this clone starts to become cytotoxic and, and is able to then secrete these molecules, interferon gamma, TNF, and these are the very cytotoxic cytokines that are then able to go and kill the cancer cells. The problem what happens is when, with a lot of chronic infections and inflammation and infections like tuberculosis, HIV, hepatitis, and also cancer, you get what we call chronic antigen exposure. The immune system gets tired. It gets exhausted, and it stops doing this. And there are blockers that happen on the surface of these T cells, and one of the very important ones is called PD-1, and it shuts down the T cell. It prevents it from becoming cytotoxic. It's almost like saying, enough already, you know, too much inflammation, you're killing the whole body trying to get rid of this infection or this tumor, let's just slow down this infection a little bit or this inflammation, and let's tolerate it, right? So this is a more tolerogenic response. And so what happens is over the course of time when you have exhaustion, you have increased, this is over time, this increase of these blocking PD-1, TIM-3, these are the blocking uh, receptors. And then IL-2, TNF, these are all the inflammatory cytokines, they decrease. So the phenotype of an exhausted T cell is you see the blocker and you don't see the cytokine. Okay. So what did happen? We thought, oh, let's look, let's see, let's look at PD-1 in our tumors. We thought, okay, if the if the if the if the um, if the um, the um, uh, cytotoxic ability of the tumor is in, is helped by the stretching, you should see a reduction in PD-1, right? Because PD-1 here blocks the cytokine response, and that's what we saw. We saw a reduction in the amount of PD-1 on the surface of uh, T lymphocyte. We also looked in the lymph node looking for this IL-2 because IL-2 is important. That's what causes the clones to proliferate, and we saw an increase. And both of these results suggest that the stretching actually helped the cytotoxic immune response. It helped the cell to, the, the body to uh, combat the tumor. So how do we put this all together? Well, on the one hand, you have this increase in interferon gamma, right, which is uh, the really sort of uh, what we think is the key uh, cytokine here that uh, allows a greater cytotoxic activity in the, in the tumor, but at the same time, you see the uh, resolvin acting to clean up the mess. So we think that this is, this is where we, we, don't, we have not shown yet a mechanism that links these two. We don't know whether there is a relationship. Uh, there are some interesting uh, papers that got published recently about a relationship between interferon gamma and prosome resolution, actually one in the lab of Dr. Uh, Bruce Levy right here at, at the Brigham where they've looked at this in asthma. We don't know. But uh, we think that there may be, uh, you know, these are very interesting areas that we want to uh, pursue in terms of understanding what's got going on. So basically, the, me the take home message really is that I think that the, the important thing is that we, we really need to pay more attention to the effect of physical based treatments that can help us uh, to understand not only the effects of mechanical forces on the body nat naturally. But how can we apply this and design treatment that can apply the right amount of the force? How much, how long, how often? These are all important things. I mean, we are not right now in any position whatsoever to recommend any type of specific stretching or you know, people uh, to do uh, for treating cancer, obviously, right? This is just an animal model. However, cancer patients are already doing yoga. They're already stretching because it feels good, because it helps them sleep, because it helps them uh, you know, with their uh, dealing with uh, some of their complaints like pain or, or fatigue. So I would say keep doing that. I mean, that's the important thing is that, is that these are treatments that are already in effect for lifestyle reasons, for well-being. And so uh, I think our job in the lab is to now try to understand the biology that may link this to the cancer biology. And so I want to acknowledge all of the people who uh, have contributed to this work. Uh, we, this work actually started at the University of Vermont way back with Dr. Artie Shukla, which we had the first, very first attempt to, to uh, try stretching in a cancer model, uh, and here at the Brigham, and also importantly, our collaboration at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute uh, with Dr. Jean Zhao, uh, Johan Burkholz, and Kim Hee Jung, who uh, they um, really uh, helped us with the uh, cancer model uh, of the, her the um, uh, breast cancer cells. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Helene. That was elegant. Um, what's the evidence that there might be some systemic effects from the stretching if in the experimental model you put the tumor elsewhere than the back? Yeah, very good question. It's very difficult to do that in an animal, right? Because the animal, as you see, it's very hard to stretch only one part of the animal. I mean, we have models right now of, of, uh, of inflammation where we try to do that, where we only stretch one part of the animal and put the inflammatory lesion somewhere else. But you have to anesthetize the animal for that. And for these models, you can't do that because you would have to anesthetize the poor mouse every day for a month. You know, that just wouldn't work. So this, this whole question of local versus systemic has been uh, very intriguing to us. We're going to try to look at that uh, slightly in a sort of a different way. In humans, we, I have uh, uh, one of our, um, our new postdoc in the lab who uh, is going to be looking at that in a model of inflammation in, in, uh, in the forearm. So if you have a tiny little bit of inflammation in one arm and then you stretch that arm, but you don't stretch the, you know, you, you only stretch the arm versus stretching the other arm, you know, you could see if there's some systemic effect. If you have inflammation on one arm and you stretch the other arm and you still get the anti-inflammatory effect, that would suggest that it's, it is systemic. There's also the whole issue of stress. When the mouse is held by the tail, it is stressed. There's no question about that. We have a control, a, another experiment in, uh, in the animal where we stretch the mouse passively under anesthesia compared with anesthesia alone. And we still see anti-inflammatory effects there, which suggests that it's not, the stress may, be, may play a role, but it's not the only thing. So these are, this is a very good question. We're, we're going to chip away at it. We know it's, 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 it's going to be a long time before we fully understand that. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, work on the pulmonary division, Miguel Diva. My question is, two, two questions, if you don't mind. One, why everything is around inflammation? And I think there is inflammation, there is fibrosis, there is also apoptosis, and there is a great paper by Dr. Los Calso that mentioned a lot of intermediary mechanisms. So I think we're narrowing too much on inflammation, and probably that helps us to measure other things that probably can be also the answer and response of what you are presenting. That's one common question. The second part is, on the latest uh, slide, there is a middle one that you have measurements and timing. So is the question about treatment to cancer to the treatment with stretching something that is randomly, you need to do it all the time, or you do it after? Is the timing part important as well? Uh, two very good uh, comment and question, yeah. As far as uh, why focus so much on inflammation, from we, this is kind of where we started from in our lab is inflammation. We moved into cancer, but totally agree with you. We, we really need to look at the whole sort of um, metabolome, you know, and, and really, obviously. Um, the question is timing. Excellent uh, point. Uh, we only uh, start, we, we started stretching the animals right after injecting the cancer cells, but we inject a very small amount of cells. So, you could almost think about it as a, almost like a preventive uh, uh, protocol. It would be very interesting, I think, to wait until the tumors have developed a fair amount and taken hold and then start stretching. We haven't done that. We could also uh, train the animals to stretch for you know, several months and then inject the cancer cells. So a lot of different experiments that we can and should do, uh, well, hopefully once we get a grant <laughs> to do that. Uh, so yeah, the timing, I think, will be, will be key. Also, we want to look at metastases. Um, one experiment that I didn't mention, back when I was at the University of Vermont, we did an experiment where we injected mesothelioma cells instead of the, the breast cancer cells in the same location. It was very interesting what happened. Uh, the only reason I did that is because I had a, a lab right next door that were studying mesothelioma. They had the model, and we said, oh, let's try injecting them. So when you inject mesothelioma cells subcutaneously, uh, most of the tumors, if you only look at them for a month, they, they stay where they are, but a small proportion of them metastasizes to the peritoneum because they're very invasive, much more aggressive tumor than the, tumor, than the uh, cancer cells we used here. And uh, we saw exactly the same difference between stretch and no stretch in the mesothelium cells, except a tiny, tiny proportion of them metastasized, and there were slightly more of them in the stretch than the non-stretch group. This was not statistically significant, the, the metastases, but it worried us enough that we didn't publish it. We waited to repl replicate it in a different model. But now I really want to go back to a metastatic model and make sure 
that this stretching does not actually enhance metastasis, because that would be bad. So there are a lot of questions, obviously. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, and great work. Um, as a former T cell immunologist, I'm curious, you, you sh I, I'm really struck by the, the shift in phenotype in the CD8 positive T cells. I'm curious if you actually looked at differences in absolute numbers of T cells in the tumor, um, and also um, not just the CD8s, but looked at other populations yeah. of T cells. Good question. We did not see a difference in the number of T cells. We looked at, oh my god, we looked so many. We looked at macrophages as well. We looked at uh, the only t type of cell, we did not look at NK cells. And they were too small. The numbers were too small. These tumors are limiting factor. There was only, these tumors were literally like one to two millimeters. So when you time me, we did the flow cytometry, we had to, to pick and choose. So we were not able to look at every single marker that we would have liked. But uh, there was a very interesting paper that was published uh, recently on the effect of exercise on NK cells. Uh, that it, it boosts uh, the, and also decreased uh, uh, tumors. These were uh, mice, mice that were uh, free running in, in exercise wheels. That, I should have mentioned that actually at the beginning. Um, we, we think there may be very much of a parallel between what goes on with stretching and what goes on with exercise. The thing is that when you look at animal models of exercise and cancer, most of them involve levels of exercise that are quite vigorous and aerobic, you know. Uh, and a lot of they make animals run on a treadmill and. Um, cancer patients a lot of times can't do that. It's too, it's too exhausting, and so that's why we thought, well, stretching might be nice uh, because, you know, it's easier to do and it's, it's not as, as aerobically intensive. But, yeah, so uh, I think there's a lot of interesting parallels with, with that. So we'll definitely have to look at these other populations as well. So this is a great... Great, a great talk, and, and it's a great model for, for treating cancer, ultimately. That, that would be the obvious implication. I'm, my mind goes to prevention. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, treating makes me nervous. Prevention, <coughs> I think, is where it's at. And, and I was intrigued by that sub-threshold injection. I'm wondering, can you do a sub-sub-threshold injection where you might be able to show that, that uh, a control, that it would turn into a tumor, whereas in a stretching model, you might actually eliminate it? I totally agree. I mean, this, this would be so interesting to see if you could just prevent it altogether. And of know? course, we know that a substantial fraction of cancer in the population is preventable, so this would be yeah. significant. Yeah. I mean, the whole idea that cancer, little mini cancers happen all the time. I mean, you know, that our body, our immune system is, is programmed and able to deal with it. It's just once in a while, it doesn't. And I think that's, that's the idea, is that, is that could you, by staying healthy, by doing a certain number of things, we already know that exercise, diet, those things help prevent. But we don't really know exactly why. And so this could be a part of it, you know? <laughs> I was really amused by the mouse that relaxed into the stretch. And to do the whole aspect of the relaxation response and how it might influence the, the combat the stress factors there. Yeah, well, so. we don't, we think the mice relax. And the way we can, te we, we, you know, again, we're, we're, we're interpreting what we see and we're not 100% yeah. sure. We can't ask them. But, you know, at first when we teach them, they, they kind of squirm, they struggle, they poop, they, you know, they do things. But after they've been trained, and this is what every one of my, you know, students and technicians tells me, is that they, you, they can tell when the mouse has had enough. They, they start squirming and they let them go. They don't force them to stretch for the, the total amount. And there, once the mouse kind of learns, um, they just, they, they seem to relax. It's very like a new yoga student would be wiggly and yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I don't know what it is, you know, and it would be very interesting to look at their brains when this is going on, <laughs> obviously. I have to ask this. Sex differences. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so these are female mice. These are actually, you know, uh, usually we use male mice. So I'm very proud to say I should have mentioned that these are female mice. <laughs> Um, you know, yeah, every one of these experiments needs to be obviously looked at. 
we're we're very interested, obviously, in looking at our inflammatory model in male and female mice. We have a, an aim of our grant. We're going to do that in rats. We're going to start that probably uh, mid middle of next year. So yeah, it's very important. Obviously, it could be completely different. Who knows? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.